All right, we are back in full effect in Detroit is different podcast studios and we keeping things rolling with creatives and you know creatives when it comes to hip hop, my favorite art form. Uh and we think about what's happening with hip hop as we're watching like generations of hip hop artists get into things just outside of being in the booth and rapping on stages. Filmmaking is heavy, especially in the city of Detroit. And being creative with this in the same expression as we're seeing like what was on paper in 16 bar formats coming to life in motion. And you're watching it. We watched the whole movement of what's happening in Tubi, Amazon Prime, and then even like other spaces, just direct the video, even the premieres. It's like a whole industry right now existing in a lot of ways. I think between me and you, it's Detroit hip hop holding this down. And when we talk Detroit hip hop, Definitely talking to one of the legends in it, Street Lord Rook. Mr. Reed, how you feeling? I'm feeling great. What's so? Oh, man, everything is cool. Everything is cool. So uh, thanks for being in effect on Detroit is Different. Uh, Rocky Harris gave a call. I'm like, yeah, you know, Detroit is Different is a form for everybody. And oh. you have a new project coming. But before we get into, like, the projects and film and the music, we're going to start this off usual Detroit is Different style. Detroit and your family. What led your family and your people to the city of Detroit? Honestly, I don't know if my family was all here. Then, like my whole family was mm. in Detroit. My mama, daddy, okay. grandma, grandparents—they all was in Detroit. So, wow. I don't really know of no other city where my family was mm -hmm. from. You no, know, okay, I don't so really know. We all been in Detroit my whole life. You no, know, since. We don't. I haven't been to a family reunion where it'd be like, "Oh, we going to Tennessee or oh, we going to <laughs> Alabama or Mississippi." Everybody been here, so you know, okay. Detroit pretty much what I know. That's like my upbringing, where I'm from. Everything okay. that I've done, pretty much started or revolved around Detroit. Okay, so neighborhoods. You you just spoke I, out uh, fam that's like in my neighborhood. You was like, "Yo, it's just like that." Uh, so what, what neighborhood? I went to grade school. I'm from like Plymouth Evergreen area. Okay. You know, they'd be like P Rock. I'm from that area. But uh, I got family lived all over West Side, East Side. You know, like right where we are now. I got an auntie who stayed on Pasadena mm -hmm. and 14th. Um, wow. I got some family from, that lived on Boston. You know, mm -hmm. I got family all around the city. Like okay, so as a kid, suburbs. As a kid, being able to travel because that's unique because most. As we know, the classic Detroit thing is like if you're from the east side, you usually mm -hmm. stay east. If you west, you stay west. If you're from down river, you stay they, down river. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Sure. So like, uh, did you did you even think when did you know that that was a little different that your fam was across the city? Real young, like very young. I had a um, a cousin that stayed on Burns on the east side, and we'd mm -hmm. go over there and we'd have fun on the east side, mm -hmm. and then. Uh, my mom had a friend that stayed on Pasadena Highland Park off Woodward. She'd take me over there, you mm -hmm. know. So I've always kind of bounced around and had friends all over. So okay, yeah. okay. And you said P Rock was what you remember in that in that <laughs> corridor. What I think I think of Detroit communities as like high school. So that's like the Cody, yep, Rouge I went to area. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. I graduated from Cody. I went to. Horseman Elementary. I went to Lessinger Middle School. Mm. I, went, I graduated from Cody. I went to Cass like ninth grade. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's my hood. Okay, so that Cody neighborhood definitely automatically brings me to Rouge stories because Rouge is, Rouge is like a different, for, for people that aren't from Detroit, because I know some of you guys that listen and check this out, Rouge Park almost feels like, in some ways, it's like National Park. It's just like, you got horses, you got a creek. Now they got that big farm with D-Town Farms. And then, like, you got a strip where people just, like, you know, bang music and play music. Like, it's a lot going on in Rouge. You know, yeah. and then people tell you stuff. It's like, oh, man, you know, the old guys out there playing chess. And it's like, you know the best horseshoe games in the city of Detroit is over in Rouge Park. Like, it's a yeah. different experience going on over there. Man, you know, I grew up over there, so... I remember going swimming, walking to go swimming at Ridge Park and jumping mm -hmm. off. Second deck was like the big thing when I was a kid. And mm -hmm. then, you know, down Dre Road, they got the RC airplanes that used to come out where people would fly mm -hmm. their uh, radio control airplanes. That always went on. Um, you know, they got the driving range, but golf course. So, yeah, it's like a 
west side, a little smaller Bella, cause yeah. it go down over there. You know that that be the hangout. Like I ride through there still today, every so often. Like I own some property in the area, mm-hmm. but you know when I'm going through there, I might cut through Ridge or right now and then, cause mm-hmm. I'm gonna see. It's never a time that I haven't cut through there where I haven't seen some friends from high school or wow. some friends from the neighborhood. Still, that's like a place where people frequently attend. And and it's a lot of attention kind of starting in that neighborhood now when we think about like some of this redevelopment, um, when we think of, of, of land that's available in the city of Detroit. Uh, when you see the differences and then some of these ideas, have you been hearing about some of these plans of like different organizations wanting to activate that space, activate places over there? W- what does that bring to mind? Um, I'm not really too familiar with it, but it's a nice neighborhood. You know, there's good people over there, you know. So to see anything going on in the community that could uplift the community is always great to me. You know, I think that's dope. I think if we put more into our community and police our community, we're, like the police know the people in the community, it would be less police gun violence against inner city youth and Mm-hmm. inner city people you know so i think anything that's community based is super dope and i think we need to get more of that going on where it's a more friendlier environment like mm-hmm. I, just to me it's my personal opinion if the police know the people in the community it's gonna be less stuff because you'll know like oh that's deandre that's miss miss johnson son or grandson and the police officers will be less likely to get into a serious back and forth. Yeah, yeah because like, oh mm-hmm. man, I know your family, I know everything about you. And, and that effort, yeah, it's it's gonna be some projects, and I would definitely hope when I think about there, I, I think about that uh, Western Precinct. What's funny is like when I think of <laughs> the police station over there, I just think of starters across the street for the yeah. most part, you know, and um, just that even that footprint. Like I say, the the that community is a heck of an asset for the west side and 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 then it's a it's a different feel to me because families um a lot of the families that are over there that that i know of have been there for generations too that's correct i know a lot of people still live over there from since i was a kid Mm -hmm. um I don't know how the precinct things work, but I've I remember that it used to be the sixth precinct. It's not called the sixth precinct over there anymore. It could still be. I know it's one of the western. I guess I should uh, say one of the western precinct. It could still be the sixth yeah, precinct. Yeah, I remember they had the crazy incident where the guy went in there and did the shooting at, yeah. at, at that at that particular precinct. But yeah, I mean, yeah, it's 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 an asset. So like. Outside of that breakdown, you saw, you spoke about Cody, but now it kind of gets right into in that rapping. I, I definitely have to say that. When did you start? When did you start hip hop? When when did that start? <coughs> I'm guessing it had to have started somewhere in that middle school, high school journey. Man, hip hop, like I grew up where I grew up at. I grew up on Plymouth and Evergreen. It was mm-hmm. Damon's Records right, right there. there. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So. I remember going to Damon's Records, buying candy and music from being a very little kid. I bought the Fat Boys <laughs> um, record. I had the Run DMC record, so I okay. might be telling my age. And, but mm-hmm. I've been in the music since a very young age. Um, my grandma, I live with my grandmother because my mom, she was mm-hmm. hustling in, in and out of um, prison. My grandmother, she kind of let me just grow up. It wasn't really a lot of curfews and rules. She just kind of let me be a boy. So, like, I remember having, like, a Two Live Crew CD wow. at a very young age. Yeah, I and listening to that, Too that Short and wild. Ice-T <laughs> at a very young age. I remember I let a friend of mine dub my Two Live Crew, Hey, We Want Some Pussy. Mm-hmm. Uh, he probably got in trouble. He, like got, he got a whoop. <laughs> I remember his mother... Like I actually just like, seen what him. Is this? <laughs> I actually just seen him um, on a movie set. We were shooting a movie, and he just so happened to walk down down the street from his house. Mm-hmm. My childhood friend. Um, mm-hmm. I don't want to put him on blast yeah, on yeah, the yeah, podcast, yeah, yeah, but yeah. he know his mother uh, yeah, whooped yeah. him about the Two Live Crew City. But like I grew up on Two Live Crew, Too Short, mm-hmm. Ice T. I had Ice T. Um, first tape, you know what I'm saying? My with days. six, 
mm-hmm. six in the morning, police at my door. Yeah. So I've been in the music for a very long time. My mother, she was um, she was a hustler. She um, years ago she did a Sir Mix a Lot concert hmm. at the State Theater when he had, wow. she she brought Sir Mix a Lot to Detroit with my posse on Broadway. Okay. Came out and uh, Prince Vincent, Awesome Dre, hmm. and um, a few other Detroit acts performed. So like I've been around me. Or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I've been around the music, music for a minute. A very long time. So let's talk a little bit about your mom, like being into, like, you know, hustling a bit, but also entrepreneurial. And obviously that had to have had a connection in, like, where things were. What was. Um, what was, you you know what I'm saying? Like when you a kid and then your mom come home and say, yo, I'm about to produce this rap show. Like I can only imagine what that would, was like. It kind of didn't go like that, but it was like, man, my mom was probably different. You know what I'm saying? We had a different relationship. We had a different bond. Mm-hmm. I remember being in like the third grade and uh, my mother coming to me, asking me, if I sold drugs, would you be mad? And I was, um, I remember crying, like, no, mommy, don't sell drugs. Like, that's bad. I don't care about having nice clothes, nice shoes. Mm -hmm. Just don't sell drugs because you could go to jail and get killed because that's how I was programmed. And then, unbeknownst to me at the time, she was already hustling. Mm -hmm. So, when they, um, she had a company, she had an office in the David Whitney building. Hmm. And, um... So when they started producing the shows, it was just like, oh. This is expanding what she's already into. This is what she's doing. Mm-hmm. But I didn't see the day-to-day of mm-hmm. of what that what of that her hustling. Was. I didn't see the day-to-day, and I didn't see the day-to-day of her setting up the business. I just, like, we got a limo. It's time to go to the show. Mm-hmm. I remember going to the State Theater and them picking out the State Theater and um, – I remember a guy who worked for her who was contacting the acts and Mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So, and when it happened, I remember being there, Hmm. but I was never able to see her sell drugs at that time. Like later on, after that, you know, I learned my mom was addicted to drugs and I Hmm. wound up going to, I probably been to every drug treatment facility in Detroit from share, share house to, all of the drug rehabilitation things that they had going on from NA meetings to AA meetings, I've been through them all, you know, so I've seen it up close and personal where today I don't smoke or drink. So I've been exposed to the good and bad. Like, yeah, when I was younger, I didn't see a lot of drugs, but I saw a lot of money. Like, it would be like a lot of money around, but not a lot of drugs. But then I seen drug usage as I got older where she... Her addiction probably was showing more where she went to prison. Mm-hmm. I lived with my grandmother, and so on and so forth. Like, so that's that that's heavy, and and, and I'm still like it, as we pivot. And, and it was funny we were at a, um, a an event for recovery, and for those that are struggling with recovery and everything, it's a day to day step, but it's some of the some of the boldest and most courageous actions especially like in communities like ours like even when you spoke about alcohol cuz alcohol is so accessible like yeah for sure everywhere you know what i'm saying <clears throat> and um and what that means in, in, in healing through that but i'm thinking like your first concert was a concert your mom produced that's yeah like that's that's yeah. like that's got to be like something different like to have backstage pays attached to your first concert and be in effect and watch it you know yeah, um, I That's can't say that was... hip hop in a different way. <laughs> I can't say that was the first concert okay. that I went to mm-hmm. because I, rem- I remember my mom taking me to see Michael Jackson. Oh, man, you saw of, Michael? I saw Michael Jackson um, at a very young age. You probably I've, I've had a blessed childhood. Like, you probably saw him on the Bad Tour. Yeah. Shout out Al Heyman. Yeah. You probably saw him I, on the Bad I, Tour. Um, I remember the tickets was like three hundred dollars. We went in the limo, and that was man. I was a kid, kid. Okay, so now I'm just about to ask from a kid perspective, and, and as a guilty kid, what was seeing Michael Jackson live <laughs> at like the peak of Michael Jackson is like? I mean, it was 
it was dope, you know. Like at that time, I probably didn't cherish like the experience, their experience to yeah, yeah. to now be like, yeah, I say I got a chance to see Michael Jackson. You know, that was mm -hmm. monumental today. Yep. But going through it, it was just like mom taking me to it a was, concert. Was, She's taking it was Saturday. You yeah, was hanging well, out with mom. Yeah. When it was going to see Michael. I yeah, like. I remember her taking me to a Salt and Pepper concert. Mm -hmm. I, I can't remember who Salt and Pepper was in town with, mm -hmm. but I remember Salt and Pepper doing Push It. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember um, talking to Curtis Blow years ago. Hmm. We were supposed to go to a Curtis Blow concert. Mm -hmm. So I've had like a music experiences. Yeah, around. because. Like, oh, wow. like my stepdad, he knew the guy, Ralph Cooper, who started the Apollo Theater. So mm -hmm. I've been backstage at the Apollo at a wow. very young age. I met Mike Tyson before he was the champ. Yeah. I yeah. met Keith Sweat before he was... Keith Sweat? Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I won't say before he was Keith Sweat because he was... He's he was probably still, always keeps yeah, wet, yeah, but, yeah, but before he before was like, he made those big yeah, hit yeah, records, yeah, yeah. make it last forever. Too yeah, so, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've had a very dope childhood mm -hmm. as a kid. Uh, I've been, I've had a lot of negativity, like from my both parents going to jail. Mm -hmm. Like my dad went to federal prison a, a mm -hmm. couple times, but I've been able to live a very blessed life right, and from, meet from a, a lot of different people. Throughout my experiences, the good and the bad, you know. So, so music during this time, when did it click that from fan to I'm about to do it myself? Um, my cousins, like my cousin O, who rapped in the street lords, and I, Blade Icewood. He he was not calling himself Blade Icewood at the time, mm -hmm. and Jesse James, and they all went and made a record. Um, the record was called "We Fooling in This Bitch." I was like the first, one so, of the first Street Lord records. Mm -hmm. And um, just my competitive drive, like, oh, if they can make a record, I can I make them make a record. record. So yeah. then I started going to the studio with them, and they would let me get, get on. on song here yeah, here. so they were far more into it than me at the time. Mm -hmm. And it's just grown, and I've gotten better. Like, mm -hmm. when I go back and listen to my Street Lord raps, do you the, think like ah, I could have did something a little bit better right there? Uh, yeah. Now you know. I mean, I'm more com. I'm more. I'm far more comfortable making records today than I was then. But mm -hmm. making records today from then is totally different. Like we yeah. were paying like three hundred dollars an hour for studio time, mm -hmm. and we were recording on two inch reels, where it's far more expensive than today's recording on Pro Tools and. Mm -hmm making music it's just a different time a different experience but you know mm -hmm. it was it's been a growth it's a learning process so what was it um in that in that creative process because really just getting into the mind of like writing songs and and finding that pace what was it about it did you like the performing did you like the writing did you like the studio more what was the what did you appreciate most um I think the Street Lords had like this competitive vibe. Like mm -hmm. everybody wanted to have the best verse, so it brought out the best in everyone. Where when people were writing their verses and putting their verses together, that it was a competitiveness to come up with the best mm -hmm. words and lyrics and the coolest things to say. So mm -hmm. you know, I just wanted mine to be the best or the dopest you know so the writing was something that you really appreciated okay yeah uh, you know I'm, I'm competitive like i play mm -hmm. sports my whole life and i'm just competitive i'm competitive today i want to win want to be successful mm -hmm. so the competitive drive keeps me going and keeps me wanting to get better and that's what everything being a better dad being a better friend mm -hmm. you know being a better businessman so all of it just is kind of up. yeah it's just a, it's about being a better person, so, being a better man all the way around. So what Rook just spoke of, for people that don't know, that have never been in the studio with rappers, it's, it can get competitive. When rappers are rapping together, sometimes it's a cypher and freestyling, but actually even 
you know, which leads me to definitely wonder the 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 beef between cannabis and LL Cool J. The whole like, did you did anybody ever change a verse? Because rappers, this is like real rap nerd stuff right now. So changing a verse would be like me and Rook on a song. I hear his verse and I'm like, wait. Mm-mm. Oh, I'm about to go back. About to go back and change that. That happens all the time. Like that, that definitely happens all the time. You know. Yeah, yeah. That, for sure. Like, oh wait, he said that. Like, hold on, I got. But that, but that sometimes yeah, can be known as like it, it's not like rap commandments, but that's one of them. That's like yeah. Uh, uh. Yeah, everybody wants to mm-hmm. have the the mm-hmm. best verse. The, yeah, the hardest lyrics. Like that's. Still goes on today. Um, sometimes I think people take rap too serious. Like mm-hmm. it's really just entertainment. Like, it, it definitely I, is. I mean, if we if we left some of the, the just looked at it as entertainment, probably be a lot less killings and violence pertaining to rap. You know, and, but, and you can definitely speak to that. I, I think I don't want to go so far into this because I mean you. Could, probably spoke on this so much and you get talked about it so much and that's one thing at least right now in this renaissance of some of the younger Detroit MCs that seem to be a lot more collaborative yeah it's a lot more togetherness today than years before but I don't know I really can't I don't know if I can say in that some le- in some ways the I reason I say I mean if you go back and listen I know uh, I don't want to dive into this because yeah 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 it's not my, but if you go listen to the first Eastside Cheddar Boy City it's a collaborative effort it's a lot yeah. of street lords on their yeah. first city definitely um, you know but I wish all those guys the best you know I don't know what they're doing I don't really keep up but I wish them the best you know yeah and, and with, it's unfortunate what happened to Blade and what happened to White Folk you know so yeah and, and I mean. Dealing with that, and then the thing, even like when I think of Tupac and Big Even and Blade and Wipeout, like so young, like at the time, it's like, damn, you that young, it, you know what I'm saying? That's the, yeah, that's you know, the, it's, it's you know. still going. Like, it's, I think it's more our our community than just those guys. Because I'm yeah, in, yeah, in yeah, every yeah. community, yeah. we can go find some rappers yeah. who was slain from Soldier Slim to the guy Trouble who yeah, was just recently. Off. Uh, Young Nipsey dog, Hustle, Nipsey. Uh, so yeah. it's like mm-hmm. our our culture. Our culture does have a level, uh, you know, one that more known. It has a level it, of it, 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 jealousy that's mm-hmm. probably like no other. Because when people become successful, everybody not happy that you're successful all the time. I want you to expound on that. Like, okay, I'll give you an example. Like. Nipsey Hussle, he's a successful guy in the community. He repping his community. Mm-hmm. And um, they say he called the individual a snitch. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, that's nothing to kill somebody over. No. <laughs> but at this, in society, the gentleman who killed him, he thought it was enough. So there had to be some jealousy there, some animosity there. Mm-hmm. At that moment, but let's say Nipsey called him a snitch. Mm-hmm. Normally, when somebody tells, that's what you're labeled. You mm-hmm. know, you told when you signed to testify or agreed to cooperate. But most people don't know that stuff is public information. Mm-hmm. So if you're cooperating, and you snitch, it's going to be people in the community that know because normally if you snitch, it's going to be you're telling on somebody who you were mm-hmm. at once friends with or doing business with. So, But everybody not always happy for you. Like in all situations, so, people be wanting to be in a person's shoes a lot more than they want to be happy with them. Like I think in a young Dolph situation, that same kid who's got arrested yeah. for killing him, he was in a video with them. Yeah. So I'm sure on that video set he wanted to be young Dolph at that time. Or, now, now as you also talk about that success, <clears throat> it's unique because you are a part of something that will go down in my mind like the arc of Detroit hip hop history. Like you, you, you're just being in the street lords. 
You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? That like puts you in in an arc of like where the reputation can proceed itself. Like I think of the arcs of Detroit rap. I think like from street rap, I think I think uh Detroit's most wanted. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? It dice. Then I think Street Lords mm-hmm. and and then I guess you could say the Cheddar Boys, and I think what Rock Bottom just being in this neighborhood, yeah. and now I think you know it, the, just the new arc of guys. You know what I'm saying, like Team Eastside, and what what, and then I guess it's younger now with yeah. 42 Doug mm-hmm. and those guys. But but in that arc, you have a reputation that proceeds. So when we talk about success and people being jealous, how much of it is like most times, like we're even misunderstanding, you know everything in your life what you deal with how things go because you walked in i mean i'm guessing for the past i don't know 15 to 20 years you walk in most rooms people know it, it, you're walking in with a reputation and these people don't even know you sure yeah that's that's for sure um how i view it and look at it like it's dope that people know me recognize and they you. and they recognize me for what we did and um, that. I think that's super dope. Mm-hmm. But when we were doing it, we didn't think we would be called legends. We were just young men trying to do something great, trying to figure out a way to get out. We was hustling and making money. Um, for me though. And this is just me. I don't know how everybody else feels. I can only speak for me. I don't feel I've reached where I'm trying to go. So I got you. for someone to be saying I'm a legend or what I did was legendary, it's more like, well, where do you see what I'm about to do? Like, I just sold drugs. Like, yeah, granted, we made millions of dollars selling drugs and we made rap music. Mm-hmm. But me as a person, as a businessman and where I'm trying to go, I haven't scratched the surface of what I'm setting out to do. So I don't feel like I've reached my potential or the level of success that I want, that my competitive drives is trying to get to. So I don't feel like I've done anything. So that that's mm-hmm. deep. So even with that reputation, and now it's people that are jealous of where you at. And you sure. still have uh, the hunger inside to do so much more. Yeah. So, and in this so much more, that's a great transition and pivot right to filmmaking. Sure. What was what was it that's like, I'm going to get into this discipline? Um, to be honest, I made a film like 20 years ago. So you can say, like, I've okay. been doing that this. Like, I spent $2 million before going to federal prison on making a movie called Envy with Ray J, Lisa Ray, the rapper AZ, mm-hmm. and uh, Chico DeBarge. So I've been... On this. In this space. Yeah, I've been in this space. like, mm-hmm. And I, I probably understand business and passive income probably a little different than a lot of people. I understand movies last 30 years. Like, if you think about it, Minister Society was just, I don't know if it's still on Netflix, but I know I just recently watched yeah, it, it was, on Netflix. It, I think it's still there now, yeah. Our Minister Society carry mm-hmm. came out 30 years ago. Yep. And it's still, somebody getting a check. Mm-hmm. Still to this day, somebody's getting a check. So I want to create something and create classics where in 30 years from now I'll still be getting a check or my kids will still be getting a check because movie music royalties they last hundreds of years like um I was blessed to be um have knowledge of this because my stepdad he owns he owned the rights as a kid for the James Brown song, It's a Man's World. So we would get a check, a publishing check, every 90 days. And I remember uh, Zeno Cologne licensed it for a million dollars when I was very young. Um, the same people who did Cool Water. I don't know if people remember those colognes, Cool Water. Um, they were colognes back in the day. They were popular. So I remember going to the guy... It was called Claire Mike's Publishing because his name was Clarence Jackson. And um, it had like a publishing deal where like Warner Chapel would, would pay him and so on and so forth. So I knew about publishing and I learned that at a very, very young age. I don't think my stepdad really could read because I would read all the contracts at a very young age. He'd be like, read this to me. 
mm-hmm. and I would read it to him, and he'd be like, so what you think that say? And I would kind of tell him what I thought based on my knowledge, even though I wasn't an attorney or business mm-hmm. man. I was a kid, but I was exposed to know that James Brown created something. I can't remember the lady's name. I, think, I want to say her name was Betty Davis or Betty. It was Betty something who wrote the record. Hmm. I don't know how my stepdad was able to obtain some of the publishing, but I do know we used to get a publishing check. Wow. And then my stepdad went to federal prison, and my brother wound up selling it to my stepbrother, wound up selling the uh, rights the to rights us all to, mm. back to Warner Chapel. Hmm. So, um, I've and, been exposed and, to that. So that's unique that you that onboarding process at a young age. So it's like you soaking up game, yeah, and, right. uh, of things like you picking up things that most people are don't know. A, a lot of artists themselves are unaware of some of how the functions of how that works. You know, the mechanical licensing. So now we're getting back into as you all know, we sometimes talk about this, the mechanical licensing. So you publish something and then you license it for usage if you kind of can follow it. And movies and films are something like that. They can last, like you say, generations. That's correct. Um, so your films that you're working on now, Cheddar Boys, what is, is that's coming. That's coming. But so so let's, let's talk a little bit about that. That's coming. June 24th, uh, you can check out the premiere. Yeah. Um, premiere at the... Effect. Premiere is at... Bel Air Cinema, um, June 24th, tickets on sale now. You can go on Eventbrite, search Cheddar Boy Films, Cheddar Boy the Movie Premiere. They're $40. Mm-hmm. Um, so I look forward to having a great turnout, great event, you know, mm-hmm. have some stars come out, participate, take pictures, give the public something positive. You know, it's all about something doing something safe. positive mm-hmm. at this at this point in life. You know, I've done enough negative, put a lot of negative in the air and energy mm-hmm. in the community, so... Right now, I'm trying to do something positive. Mm, the movie is based about choices and decision making. So, mm-hmm. how I look at it, if I give people some tools about making better choices and decisions, maybe I can lead some people to make better decisions so they can have a better life for themselves, where they won't end up in jail or in a grave or something of that nature. So, that's what I'm on. Mm-hmm. I have a movie that's out already. Um, it's called One More Flip. Dope Project's been mm-hmm. streaming, went viral quite a few times. Okay. Uh, stars me. Streaming uh, where at? It's streaming on Amazon and Tubi right now. So okay. It stars me, Mina Monroe, Sada Baby, Payro, mm-hmm. um, guy named Chris Collins, uh, Elizabeth Fox, uh, Tanya. Can't think of Tanya's last name, but Tanya's in the movie. Okay. Uh Tristan, I can't think of Tristan's last name. I know, I know Tristan. Fazekas, that's one of yeah, my homies. Yeah, Fazekas, yeah. yeah um, you can't forget that, Fazekas. <laughs> uh, Diesel, um, Trick Trick's brother. Um, mm-hmm. It was a dope cast. You know, a lot of people came out. Um, they said we did better. We sold out the Imagine and um, Royal Oak. Like oh, that's dope. every every theater, so congratulations, congratulations! I said we did better than, than Avengers, so you know that was a <laughs> that little was dope, good. dope thing. So, you know, we're just trying to keep it going. Mm-hmm. As a filmmaker, film producer, I'm trying to tell um, urban stories from our point of view. You know, um, I've been blessed where I'm in a position to tell the story how I want to tell it, or the director and how I, we're, where and we I want think, to tell it. I think that's that's why it's so much, even though I know I've talked to a lot of people, they're like, no, I'll call them independent films, not Detroit films. But it is a genre of independent films from Detroit that are gaining national, international attention right now. That is correct. As I think the stories being told kind of match more of like what you said, like from a perspective how we sell it. Not necessarily saying the Hollywood stories aren't of a black experience, but it'll sometimes be some stuff that happens in a Hollywood movie where you like, eh, I don't know. If- I, I think they'd be like a little, a little watered down because, um, in business, the person who puts up the money normally has the last say. So yeah. So the person in these urban projects that has the last last say so is the culture, the people of the culture that are putting up the money, mm-hmm. like me as myself. Like so, I'm able to say. I'm from that environment. I'm from the hood. Mm-hmm. I've sold drugs. I've been a p- 
part of shootouts. I've been a part of all different negative things. And I've seen people got shot. I have friends that's been killed. So I kind of can tell the story from a real life, realistic, like this really happened point of view. Mm -hmm. And um, by being independent and doing it all myself, I'm able to look at the analytics where I can see it's people in South Africa watching this movie. Yeah. There's people in the UK. It's people in Germany. It's people in Canada. It's people all over the world that's tuning in that like what we're doing. So I definitely don't say I'm a Detroit filmmaker because I make film for the world. I get yeah. a lot of people from all over that comes to me and comment from every state in America and different countries that... That are connecting with your work. That like what we're doing. So in filmmaking, just from the filmmakers I know, like you wear a lot of hats in filmmaking. Yeah, for because, sure. <laughs> because it's it, first off, is you, you need the film itself. So you need written. You need a project that can be written. Then after a project is written, for most people, just so that you all know the arc of this, because my sister's into it and other people I know. After it's written, comes to okay. Now, someone needs to produce this. The executive producer steps in. Usually, pu uh, puts down money. But then you need other producers to step in and like logistically bring to life whatever this is you can't just say walk in a bar that's what you see on the script and then the person walks in the bar you gotta coordinate what bar to get when you can get the bar uh, how long you gonna need the bar yeah how long you gonna need the bar uh, the camera team the camera people gotta go in there and say okay well if we gonna use this bar we gonna need this type of lighting and this type of uh, sound gaffing and we gonna need draping and, 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 and uh, what's they call that like the the pipe and draping the, the block this side of the, yeah. the window like it becomes so much more deep than just you know, uh, like a lot of people say, hey, you can just pull out a camera phone and start. No, it's, yeah. it's so much more deep. Yeah, than that. it's a lot more work that goes into it. But. So with it and wearing all these hats and then casting, then also directing. Then after it's directed, it must be edited. Yes. And then if you have music in it, you definitely got to clear all the music. Sure. And, and then the sound. And then, OK, also, this is another thing in movie that most people don't know. The sound is like two levels of sound in movies. So like if I if I break some glass in in the movie, that's recorded there. But then you have another sound tech to come in with the sound effect for the glass breaking, which is yeah. all sound of these design. steps in the process. How, how do you project manage? Like how did you take on like project managing all these different groups of folks coming together, all focused on like one mission it's a team effort like um i won't never say it's it's all me like mm -hmm. i have a, a team shout out ronnie kirk shout out jeff brown um shout out stan shout out ty everybody it's so many people worked on one more flip it's a whole new not a total new batch on cheddar boys but i have like six films done right now Mm -hmm. And I'm shooting one. I'm casting for one in a few weeks. So we're just staying busy. But it's not just me. Like I, okay. I'm not saying I'm I'm Superman and I can do all of this. Mm -hmm. No, it's a team. It's no I in team. Everybody's putting forth their best effort. We're always looking to hire great workers who are willing to come in and work with us. Because right now we don't have the budgets to make mm -hmm. blockbuster Hollywood pictures, but. I think we're very competitive mm -hmm. with the pictures we're making. Yeah. And um, I think we're making a mark where Hollywood is going to take notice of filmmakers in Detroit. Because if you look at Tubi, Tubi is like a umpteen billion dollar company. Yeah. And they're supported by a lot of urban. Independent filmmakers. Independent filmmakers. So. so so, but even getting into this, because it, when you're the filmmaker, a lot of that EP, it's, it's like you're kind of also the person shaping to life either with your own money or getting investment to the project. Yeah. What is the, the, the dance? And then also, I mean, as much as money is an asset, time is an asset, too. So it's like I, I assume you're. I haven't been able to. 
I haven't had any investors on any wow, of the projects. Wow, all of this has been independent from you. Yeah, I've been. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have other businesses that I've been successful in. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. I own physical therapy clinics that mm-hmm. I've been successful in. So I've made money in physical therapy that allowed me to pursue. To invest in this. To pursue my dreams and do something different. As for other filmmakers, I don't know, but I can I can honestly tell you now that I have a film out, I've gotten several offers, hmm. several people trying to give me hundreds of thousands to produce projects and do projects. So, okay, but okay, so if it's out of your own pocket, that even makes it more of a you definitely are in that chair where you're making decisions on teaming, staffing, what this is going to look like, you know. Paying the cost to be the boss, as they say, as another James Brown song. That's yeah, an interesting I, um, position. You know, I'm in all the decision making. So everything that pretty much goes on sets from people's staff's pays to marketing the films to I'm there. You know, I I know about it like the back of my hand, but. I mean, I also have people who... So you empower the team to make the decision, but you're still present as the decisions are being made. Yeah, that's for sure. 100% for sure. Okay. And uh, so how are you balancing just (laughs) the life of Mr. Reed and family and the other business? Like, how how do you uh, do the balance of that? Um, My family life is probably not where I want it to be, to be a thousand percent honest. I mean, we, we just... Work it out as a team because, like, when you're trying to build something, you got to put a lot of hours in it. So I'm trying to build a great company. So I put a lot of time into it. I believe you get out what you put in. That's what I teach my kids, like, no matter what it is. Um, I'm blessed. I'm not I'm not married, but mm-hmm. um, I have a girlfriend. So mm-hmm. she's probably not happy with the long hours on set some days, you know. My kids are not probably always happy, but. My kids have been to set. They how do they respond to to being present and seeing their dad in that creative space? Um, each kid is different, and okay. um, the older kids and like I have a, I'll say the older kids when I probably was doing it at first before they was able to see the finished project. They're probably like. Mm. Man, you need to just go on and sit down and just keep doing <laughs> Get back this. in the studio and do the physical Not, No, they, I'll be honest. Like My kids are probably like my toughest critics. They probably wish I didn't do it. And then they 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 were so young when we were popular mm-hmm. from the street stuff and the rap stuff that they don't, they probably don't value it. But then when their friends, parents, or their friends like, oh, your dad's such and such, they're like, like dang, dad! Like you, you really are who. You, <laughs> I said, like, you but to legend, to to them, I'm just their dad. You know, like yeah, yeah. You they don't really care legend. about that. I'm. You're they ain't thinking about like to, their dad is yeah, yeah, a yeah. street legend, a rap yeah, legend. Yeah, yeah. They more like you go just, to the piston game. You you in the party and you on the jumbo tron. They just looking at you like, uh, dad. Yeah, they. Can they, I get a hundred dollars? <laughs> yeah, they they're different, so but. At the one more flip premiere, they probably start respecting it a little more. Like they come okay. on set, but coming on set seeing these cameras, they don't really know what's going on. So mm-hmm. when they've seen the finished product, they're like, "Oh, that was good. Like, yeah, I, I'm proud of you. Like, I really like that. I enjoy that." So that's a dope feeling because I know like my kids, they like probably the toughest critics. Toughest they, critics. So you they work. brutally honest. They. Mm-hmm. It would just probably rather me just be a business owner, and that's uh, it. Do you do you see any of them kind of picking up any of anything in filmmaking themselves? Like, do you see some of the niche like moving around, like somebody staring a little bit more? Like, yeah, you want to mm, maybe get behind this camera? Not right now. Not I right mean, now. I've okay. like my oldest, like my kids. I'm I'm truly blessed, like as a, as a dad, as a co-parent with other parents, because I'm I'm not married. Uh, my kids' mother, they they. They've done fine jobs, you know. I, um, I got four kids. Mm-hmm. Well, I have five kids, mm-hmm. four biologically, but the fifth one, she's not biologically my but kid, but she's kid. really my that's kid. Like yeah. I've raised her twenty five years. Yeah. Um, she has a son now. That's my mm. that's my grandson. Wow. Um, she graduated from Michigan State. Oh man. So I, I'm yeah. blessed, you know. Yeah. She she did her thing. I got mm-hmm. another daughter who just recently graduated from Michigan State. Congratulations. Um. Last month. Okay. I got a daughter who go to Stanford. 
Mm. Right now, she's about to be a junior at Stanford. So I'm, I'm blessed. Now I got two little kids. They both all A's. Mm. Um, it's not all me. Mm. Hats off to their moms. Even though we had our moments where we don't get along, we mm. not mm. in agreement with one another all the time, but we've found a way to, to figure it out and, yeah. um, and grow that. And so, develop so you, great children. You spoke to, and this has been a theme that I sometimes feel like when you're big in, when you're building a vision bigger than what's in front of you, it's going to definitely take time and effort that you may not necessarily feel you have. So in that balance, as you say, like you're building something that's going to be a success, as you say, reaching the success, you got the hunger still in you. How how are you speaking with family, friends, and, like, you're foregoing on, like, some of the things that I'm sure a lot of other people, especially at your level, that you've had successes. You, you know, you have a successful business, but that hunger's still in you. Like, how do you how are you interacting with the uh, everybody else to be like, yo, I'm going to be on set possibly from, like, 8 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock at night? I mean, people like... Some don't get it. You know, they just don't get it. Like, I mean, it's work, man. Like, you mm-hmm. get out what you put in. Like, it's either you're going to make the sacrifice or you're not. Mm-hmm. Like, to me, whatever it is that you want to be great at, you got to put the work in. Like, if you want to be a good student, you got to study. Like, that's facts. Like, if you, if you don't study, you ain't going to get no good grades. If you want to be a good drug dealer, you got to keep hustling. You got to cop and save your money and mm-hmm. cop more and keep copping more till you able to get to a certain level where you comfortable because if it was easy everybody was doing it so to make be a great filmmaker i gotta put the time in like no matter what you do it's work to be a great basketball player you got to be at the court regularly mm-hmm. putting in the time you get out what you put in it may not happen when you want it but you gotta put it in somebody who runs an investment banking firm. They put a lot of time in the numbers and researching companies and different things to become a good investment company. It doesn't happen without putting the work in. So and and, and it's a lot of people that sometimes won't understand that. That's why I'm saying like, you know, if you're as you said you said that, yeah, some people just won't understand. But they'll be family. They'll be like a, a home a, a friend. It's like you can't come over here and watch the NBA finals right now. And it's like, uh <laughs> Man, but it's like in in the real world in the grand scheme of things, everybody said they want to be successful. I don't know, not one person who said they don't want to be successful or they don't want to be great. Mm-hmm. But how you tell if they really want to be great is is they really putting the work in to be great. If they if you don't see them putting the work in, like um, I was at a barbershop yesterday, and they were having a discussion. I thought it was really dope at my homeboy barbershop on Jero at Emonics, man. Shout out to those guys. Man, they were bringing up young men, making them more accountable mm-hmm. for their actions. And they was asking the young men about being accountable and just giving them life, life lessons. But these are all people of the community, from ex-felons to barbers to businessmen you know barbershop everybody goes in and there was a young man in there and um they were asking him different things but so i asked him like what do you what do you want to be in life he was like i just want to make it out the hood so i asked the gentleman to be a little more specific can you be a little more specific because what does that mean i want to make it out the hood you can drive eight miles up the road and you'll be out Out of the out the hood but so at first he wasn't grasping. So I was like, what does your career look like? What do you want to do in life? So he blurts out, I want to be in the medical field. I'm like, be more specific. And uh, he, he yells out, I want to be an anesthesiologist. Hmm. I was like, okay. So I was like, how's your grades? He's like, man, they f-, he tell, he, he's straightforward. He's like, man, they fucked up. Mm-hmm. So my response is, Oh, you don't want to be an anesthesiologist. You think somebody going to let you give you some medicine and put them to sleep? And you got bad grades? You're going to kill somebody. Like, you don't want to be an anesthesiologist. I can tell you that because you're not putting the work in right now to be an anesthesiologist. You're not getting into med school with bad grades. Mm -hmm. So let's 
start holding people accountable at a very young age. Hmm. Like those are some of the things I think need to be said now. So I thought it was a dope experience. I was, yeah, I was proud I was of the say, guys every, at the barbershop. Like, everybody man. watching that, just you telling that story, naturally going to say, how did he, how did he respond? He was like, yeah, I got to start being more accountable. Because what I thought was dope, he didn't know the definition of accountability when one of the gentlemen wow. had um, brought the word up. And the, young, the man was telling him about when he was 16, how he had a baby at a young age. So it transformed into another one of the guys who was there. He's a community activist. He was like, if you don't know what the word means, it's okay. Everybody in here don't know everything. We all in here still learning. Mm -hmm. He's like, but bro, you got a phone. Google it. Look it up. Mm -hmm. So you can know what's going on. Don't be ashamed to say you don't know something. Because they were in the bar barbershop saying like, man, it's like we bombarding them. And, uh, the, the community activist, he is a returning citizen for prison. He's like, they're going to be bombarding him when he's sitting on the, on the bench. About to send his ass to jail, they're going to be bombarding him, too, with a bunch of questions. So if he feel overwhelmed right now, that's fine. Hopefully some of it stick with him where he don't go down that path where he getting bombarded with the type of stuff where he going to lose his freedom. So it was a real dope environment. I was proud of the gentleman who was taking time out to help some young men in the community. I was proud to see it because... I honestly was just going into the barber shop to get a line up, and it was the barber. Me and the barber go back. He was we've been in class. We were classmates since first grade. We both from the neighborhood. We still keep in touch. He's doing a fine job in the community. He has other businesses, so it was dope to walk in on that, and it was like, oh yeah, it's still good in the community. We need more stuff like this. So. That's deep. That that's uh. That's deep, and like even the pivot point, like even before this interview, you, you walked up, you met Keith Bennett with for years with Flip the Script, and some of that, um, just talking game, like it's unique to that those moments that you talk about what that what that is being accountable, and in my mind, I, I call it the economic term of opportunity costs. For every opportunity you take, it's going to cost you these opportunities you don't. And a lot of that opportunity costs in entrepreneurship, I believe we put in often. I often echo, you know, with my father, my grandfather, my mother, like so many entrepreneurs being around, like it was more normalized, yeah. you know, that I, I could do this. But some people don't have, have an idea like what you say, where it's like I saw my father work like for real. 14 hours you know what I'm saying yeah. so like if you don't have a premise of that and you're thinking you know 9 to 5 I'm gonna get off at 5 o'clock I'm just yeah. gonna turn my phone off it's the weekend I'm not gonna do anything yeah. you know rich your movie not coming out or, or it's not coming out probably with the terms and the it, yeah for sure uh, I, I have those conversations with a lot of the, like we're programmed and we're programmed by what we see a person who parents, probably both parents, work at the plant. Let's say dad's a plant worker, mom's a nurse. The odds of those children from their offspring being uh, entrepreneur probably soon. Because yeah. in the household they've seen go to work, go to work, go to work, go to work. Those parents have kind of programmed their kids to get jobs. And, and it's nothing wrong with that, but mm -hmm. that's just how it is, you know. And, and and more than the job, it's to it to fill a level of security from a paycheck. I've been I've never liked jobs. Yeah, I know. And even had the a project, <laughs> even the project I'm working now, I'm like, I'm I'm raising twenty five hundred thousand, and I'm like twenty five hundred into it, and it's like we are gonna still figure this out. But mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, it was Mark Wahlberg. I don't know if he made this up or. I don't know if he made it or he heard it, but I heard it from him of like, if your dreams are set at the level of the amount of money and resources you have, then you're never going to get beyond where you think you are. So it's like, if we don't have a vision of, you know what I'm saying? It's like, mm -hmm. if your vision for films isn't Marvel Studios, 
Man, you'll that's... never get to Marvel. You know what I'm saying? If Man. you just limit, and then furthermore, when you get to Marvel Studios, it's going to become Marvel Universe. And when you get to Marvel Universe, it's going to become Marvel Galaxy. It's like it continues. It keeps growing. Yes. Like, um, I tell people that now. The people who work with me, they, pr- they probably get sick of me saying it because I'll be like, <laughs> Disney is not better than us right now. They just have a bigger bank than us. Yes. That's it. Yeah. Like, every film company, a record company, is just a bank. That's all it is. Mm-hmm. We call it Disney. We call it Universal. But really, it's just a bank. A bank that finances projects that invest in artists or film. Once we get enough money building our brand slowly but surely, we're going to be able to do the same thing on the same level. They just had a head start. Yeah. We're no different. A lot of times, those larger companies come buy us out or give us some money that we never seen, so we don't even pursue being Disney. Yes, all it is is a bank. And and that kind of shifts me back a little bit to, and now I'm thinking you may have been more involved in this with the music. You all had a record store. Yeah. Thing. Which was so, and, and I know you guys are listening like, huh, what, not, why? Because they, I, I've i never, the only other artist that thought like that that I know of was, surprisingly, this is going back to James Brown. Because James Brown had his radio station, his record store, his public, like, but it was such a weird pivot to be like, damn, they got their own record store. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? And, and I don't even know why that's so shocking to think that an artist actually with a point of sale offering is rare. But yeah. y'all were thinking from that perspective then that yeah. made it so different than everybody else. Because everybody else is relying on like the system, the machine, and yeah. and we got to get in the system and in the machine to offer whatever our product is. Man, this is the key thing to being successful, being great in anything. Just believing in yourself. If you believe you can do it, you can do it. Along the way, it's going to be a lot of people who say you can't do it and this and that. Or, But if you believe, it'll happen. Just keep working. Just keep going. That's all you got to do, man. And it, it, it really might sound arrogant, but it's simple, man. Just believe in yourself, stay consistent, and keep going. That win out with anything, anything. Just keep going. Don't accept the rejection. Just keep going. That's deep. Most of the time, people don't like whatever you're doing at first. They see it. Other people start liking it. The more and more people start liking it, then everybody starts, oh, yeah, that's it. But there's very few people that's going to jump on the bandwagon in the beginning. Just keep going. There's so many stories about how people failed in the beginning that kept going. Imagine if Michael Jordan would have gave up basketball when he got cut from his high school team. Mm -hmm. Or imagine if Walt Disney would have stopped working on this stuff when people was like, man, there's no place in showbiz for that. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Hmm. That's it. You you (laughs) made it simple. You made it simple as we get to the end, so... Now I'm going to just give you the classic. Remember, Cheddar Boys premiere June 24th at the Bel Air, Cin- Bel Air Cinema. Um, be in effect. It's on Eventbrite. I'm going to put that in the lower third. So check it, check it, check it, check it. Uh, support it. I'm going to be in effect that day. So I'm coming out. I'm getting, I may even donate another ticket to one of you guys on Detroit. Oh, but, yeah, man. I, I'll donate some tickets to some of you, your, okay, your for audience, sure. man. That's for sure they locked in. Uh, I want to say shout out to those guys at the barbershop. I, I didn't get a chance to mention the name, but I think it's dope. I would like to see what they're doing. Grow, name Imani Barbershop. Shout out to my man L. Shout out to Zoe, who's over there, the community active activists keeping it going. Mm-hmm. Shout out to those guys. I'm proud of you. I was really impressed with what you guys did yesterday. So Imani's Barbershop on Joy Road, man, it was a dope experience. Mm-hmm. I look forward to seeing it again if you guys need me. Okay. Man, I'm there.
That's deep. That's deep. And that's that, that's as we call it, that's the exit nine Joy Road. That's not the Joy near Claremont, the northwestern Joy Road that I'm yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, exit nine. It's like Joy right Road is like a whole way. other universe sometimes. It's like yeah. the McKenzie Joy Road. The <laughs> yeah, that's right, the exit so, nine Joy Road. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, DZ made that. Yeah. You know, now. DZ from everybody. my hood. Yeah, yeah I know. I agree. It's like the, everybody you know, that is Joy Road. What did we think it now? Um, so, classic Detroit is different questions. Your very first car, year making model, and what year did you get it? Man, my first car was a '72 Cutlass. Wow. I bought it from this lady named Kathy for two hundred dollars. Man, it was raggedy as shit. <laughs> well, I say I was fifteen. I bought it. <laughs> she lived in the neighborhood with me. I bought it. I wound up selling the car later for five hundred dollars just because okay, the so engine. You, you was you, you just because the engine. You been just because the engine was good, sense. but it was uh, terrible, man. We, I just really bought the car to like go to parties in the neighborhood. But we, uh, the car was so raggedy, we had parked down the street and hop out and walk. You know? Hilarious! But it was raggedy as hell. But what What was the first place you went when you got it? I ain't going nowhere in that raggedy motherfucker. We just <laughs> went. <laughs> we was, Man, we just waited till like it was a party kind of far that we couldn't, mm -hmm. and we just drove it. But okay, it was like a cutlass with like bench seat, and but the seats was all tore up. Damn near like a Tasmanian double had got up. Wow, got in there and ripped out all the seats because all the cotton was everywhere. We would have to put oh, like some man. covers over it. So yeah, mm. you know, it was, hey, hey, everybody got to start. Yeah. <laughs> that's a classic Detroit <laughs> question. If uh, okay, you're the DJ at the Detroit Fireworks. Woodward and Jefferson. You get to play three songs. What three songs you playing? To get the crowd to go crazy? It's whatever you feel. It's your vibe. You the man, DJ. Man, this, this might sound bad, man. It might sound biased. But I'm going to play KDZ. Okay. Uh, Joy Road, Exit 9, come up off the freeway. I'm going to play that. <laughs> Uh, I think okay. I think they'll go crazy because I think everybody in Detroit know that record. Yeah, they do. They do. So oh. that's that's one. I'm gonna play Street Lord Jesse James. Okay. Dope man. I think okay. I, I think everybody know that. A lot of people everybody know that too. A lot of people know that record. Mm -hmm. And then the last record I'm gonna play. I roll with my niggas, get high with my niggas. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, with that's my so niggas. basically, it's it, it's like it's Man. like it, it would be like the uh, like uh, how how the Super Bowl was Dr. Dre's and, and, and Snoop's. Oh, man. It would be like it would be like the the street lord fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I just feel like <laughs> no, that would be that's that's gonna be a vision. I don't. That I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Hey. I never thought that Dr. Dre would be doing that at the Super Bowl. So I would not be far fetched if the NFL draft is coming here. It'd be like a street lord party. Low key, you know what? While I'm talking about it, I need to try to. I don't we know. Talk, it, it may be something that comes to life for that. Like a real. I don't know. That I'll, affair may be. Oh, man. It's I forgot, people. man. We have, I might play Boss Up and Get This Money. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you know Y'all you know, like, have some bitch, man. Y'all. I bitch. mean, I think. And yeah. y'all would. It would be I, I see like a sea of of as I, like how I used to always remember y'all. I see a sea of sleeveless chinchillas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, real, 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 yeah, real think, frames, as they say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those those be the records I I will play right now. You know, okay. I mean. And if you had to rename what we're after one Detroiter, who would it be and why? Man, right now I name it after Blade Icewood. You know, I think he's. Mm -hmm. Left yeah. a legacy on the city. Like, I mean, really, he's left an international. I don't know if y'all hear it, but I hear it. Like when I listen to, like, a lot of the West Coast guys, especially like uh, Problem yeah. Perico. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I listen to those guys. Jay Worthy. It's like I hear so much of y'all influence. Where it's like they may not be saying they listening to the street lords, no he but they have to be listening to the street they, they get they give us shout outs man because like problem got a record where he like redid some blaze stuff and um mm. filthy rich you know he rocks with us he gives a yeah. shout out so it's it's all love to the west coast rap the bay area you know we started that bay area connection with the mm. street lords e40 be legit shout out those guys max shine uh you know we did records with the dog pound Daz, you know what i'm saying so it was that bridge is there. 
Up and it, and the up and the newer up and coming mm-hmm. rappers have kept it going from payroll to Sada to Peasy, Peasy, mm-hmm. the Vezo. They've all, you know, it's evolving, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's it's dope. It's a great thing to see Detroit rap where it is today, and uh, to see the younger generation from Four Two Ducks to Babyface to Peasy, Payroll, Sada, mm-hmm. Vez. To see them all doing their thing, like Definitely. that's that's dope. That's an inspiring GT to see all those guys creating a wave and creating a life where their kids are gonna be able to eat. And for those guys not to have to do no hustling, I think that's super dope. And, and I mean, you keeping that going too by you got Sada in the film. It's like you're oh, yeah. and payroll. It's like you're you're throwing out other platforms for them to connect with too, which is. Like I'm telling you, like I know you're not you're not accepting you like LeBron that's still in the game. Like, yo, no, nah, no, nah, I'm about to you know I'm about to bust your ass. It's like you ain't you ain't LeBron. Like, hey, don't be giving me no flowers, John Morant. You about to get you about yeah, to get this sure. forty dropped on you right now. But you still are like LeBron and Ja, and because those guys, yeah, like on the soundtrack, I got soundtrack. I got record with Babyface Ray. Got mm-hmm. record with Sada. I got records with. Street Lord One, you know, a lot of records, payroll, mm-hmm. a lot of Detroit artists, up and coming artists. So yeah, it's I still been working, you know what I'm saying? But it's now I just kind of yeah, put it on them a different way, you know what I'm saying? I'm, hey, and you still giving them a platform, and that's what Detroit is different all is about. So that's powerful. Make sure you check this out. Thank you so much. This was way doper than I was thinking. Like you gave so much other game as he he said it best. Put in the work. Put in the work for all y'all entrepreneurs. As everybody says, as you say, as everybody says they want to be a success. Right now, the gateway to success in most people's minds is entrepreneurship. You heard the man. You got to put in the work, and he's put in the work big time, money, time, effort, and letting that creativity play off now. And let's stay connected to that creativity. All right, thanks. Thank you. Peace. Detroit is Different is where you get information, artistry, history, music, and even comedy. Detroit is Different, a home for the culture of Detroit. Visit online at DetroitIsDifferent.com today.